starting from the staff table, his long silver beard and half moon glasses shining brightly in the candlelight. Several seats along, Harry saw Gilderoy Lockhart dressed in the robes of aquamarine. And then, at the end, was Hagrid, huge and hairy, drinking deeply from his goblet. Hang on, Harry muttered to Ron, there's an empty chair at the stair staff table. Where's Snape? Professor Severus Snape was Harry's least favourite teacher. Harry also happened to be Snape's least favourite student. Ron, sarcastic and disliked by everybody except the student from his own house, Slytherin. Snape taught potions. Maybe he's ill. Maybe he's left, said Ron. I mean, said Harry. Because he missed out on defence against the dark arts job again. Or maybe he might be sacked, said Ron enthusiastically. I mean, everyone hates voice right behind them. He's waiting to hear why you two didn't arrive on the school train. Harry spun around. There, his black robes rippling in a cold breeze, stood Severus Snape. He was a thin man with sallow skin, a hooked nose and greasy shoulder limbs, black and at this moment he was smile he was smiling in a way that told Harry, he and Ron what in deep trouble. Follow me, said Snape, not daring even to look at each other. Harry and Ron. Followed Snape up the stairs into the vast, echoing entrance hall, which was lit with flaming torches. Delicious smell of food was wafting from the great hall, but Snape led them away from the once and light down a narrow stairway that led into the dungeon. He said, opening the door halfway down the cold passageway and pointing. They entered Snape's office, shivering. The shadowy walls were lined with shelves of glass, glass, large glass jars in which floated all manner of revolting things. Harry didn't really want to know to name of at the moment. The fireplace was dark and empty. Snape closed the door and turned to look at them. So, he said softly, the train isn't good enough for the famous Harry Potter and his faithful sidekick Weasley. Wanted to arrive with a Bang, did we, boys? No, sir. It was the barrier at King's Cross. It. Silence. Said Snape coldly. What have you done with the car? One gulped. This wasn't the first time Snape had given Harry the impression of being able to read minds. But a moment later, he understood. And Snape unrolled today's issue of the Evening Prophet. You were seen. He hissed. Showing them the headline. Flying Ford and mystifies smugglers. He began to read it around aloud. Two muggles in London, 
convinced they saw an old car flying over the post office tower. At noon, in an old car, no, in, at noon, in an, in Norfolk, Mrs. Hetty Bayless, while hanging out her washing, Mr. Mr. Angus Fleet, off he was, reported to police. Six or seven muggled in all. I believe your father worked in the Miss Yule. Marvel artifacts. He said, looking up at one and smiling, still more nastily. Dear, dear, his own son. Harry felt as though he'd just been walloped in the stomach by one of the Madrid's larger monsters. If anyone found out that Mr. Weasley had bewitched the car, he hadn't thought of that. I noticed in my search of the car park that considerably damage seemed to have been done to a very valuable whooping will Snape went on. That tree did more damage to us than we when blotted up. Silence! Snapped. Snape again. Most unfortunately, you are not in my house, and the decision to expel you does not rest with me. I shall go and fetch the people who do have that tatty power. You will wait here. Harry and Ron stared at each other, white faced. Harry didn't feel hungry anymore. He now felt extremely sick. He tried not to look at a large, slimy something suspended in the green liquid on a shelf behind Snape's desk. If Snape had gone to fetch Professor McGonagall, head of Gryffindor House, they were hardly in any better off. She might be fairer than Snape, but she was still extremely strict. Ten minutes later, Snape returned, and sure enough, it was Professor McGonagall who accompanied him. Harry had seen Professor McGonagall angry on several occasions, but either he had forgotten just how thin her mouth could go. Oh, he had never seen her this angry before. She raised her wand the moment she entered. Harry and Ron both flinched. She mer merely pointed in the empty fireplace where flames suddenly erupted. Sir, she said, and they both sit. Sit, she said, and they both backed into chairs by the fire. Explain, she said. Her glances glinting ominously. Ron launched into the story, starting with the barrier at the station, refusing to let them through. So we had no choice, Professor. We couldn't get on the train. Why didn't you send us a letter by owl? I believe you have an owl, said Professor McGonagall. Coldly to Harry. Harry gaped at her. Now she said, that seemed the obvious thing to have done. I did. I. I didn't think that," said Professor McGonagall. "Is obvious." There was a knock on the door. Of this door, and Snape, now looking happier than ever, opened it. That's it, the headmaster, Professor Dumbledore. Harry's whole body went numb. Dumbledore was looking unusually grave. He stared down his very quick nose at them and then 
Harry suddenly found himself wishing he and Ron were still beaten up by the whooping willow. There was a long silence. Then Dumbledore said, Please explain why you did this. It would have been better if he had shouted. Harry hated the disappointment in his voice. For some reason, he was unable to look Dumbledore in the eyes and spoke and said to his knees. He told Dumbledore everything except that Mr. Weasley owned the bewitched calf, making it sound as if he and Ron happened to find a flying calf park outside the station. He knew Dumbledore would see through this at once, but Dumbledore asked no questions about the car. When Harry finished being continued to peer at them through his spectacles. We'll go and get our stuff, said Ron in a hopeless sort of voice. What? Are you talking about Weasley? Barked Professor McGonagall. Well, you're expelling us, aren't you? Said Ron. Harry looked quickly at Dumbledore. Harry looked quickly at Dumbledore. Not today, Mr. Weasley, said Dumbledore. But I must impress upon both of you the seriousness of what you have done. I will be writing to both of your families tonight. I must also warn you that if you do anything like this again, I will have no choice but to expel you. Snape looked as though Christmas had been cancelled. Glitter stood and said, Professor Dumbledore, these boys have flouted the decree of the restrictions on underage wizardry, caused serious damage to an old and valuable tree. Surely acts of this nature it will be for Professor McGonagall to decide on these boys' punishment. Severus, Severus, said Dumbledore calmly. They are in her house and are therefore her responsibility. They are no way. He turned to Professor McGonagall. I must go back to finish the feast, Minvera. I've got to give out a few notices. Come on, Severus. There's a delicious looking custard tart. I want to sample. Snape shot a look of pure venom venom at Harry at Harry and Ron as he allowed himself to be swept out of his office, leaving them alone with Professor McGonagall, who was still eyeing them like a wrathful eagle. You'd better get along to the hospital room um Weasley. You're bleeding. Not much, said Ron, happily wiping the cut of his wire um, with his sleeve. Professor, I want to watch my sister being sorted. But Harry cut in. No, wait. Your sister's also in Gryffindor. And sc oh, good, said Ron. And speaking of Gryffindor, Professor McGonagall said sharply, but Harry cut in. Professor, when we took the car, the time hadn't started. 
So, so Gryffindor shouldn't really have taken points from it, should he? He finished watching her anxiously. Professor McGonagall gave him a piercing look, but he was almost sure she had smiled. Her mouth looked less thin anyway. I will not take any points from Gryffindor. She said, and Harry's heart lightened considerably. But you will both get a detention. It was better than Harry had expected. As for Dumbledore, as for Dum, as for Dumbledore. No, wait, Harry knew perfectly well they'd just be disappointed that the wimping weather hadn't squashed him flat. Professor McGonagall raised her wand high again and pointed it at Snape's desk. A large plate of sandwiches, two silver goblets and a jug of iced pumpkin juice appeared with a pop. <laughs> you will eat in here and then go more straight up to you or your dormitory, she said. I must also return to the feast. When the door had closed behind her, we let out her long, low whistle. I thought we had it, he said, grabbing a sandwich. So it died, said Harry, taking one too. Can you believe our luck? Said one thickly through a mouthful of chicken and ham. Fred and George must have flown the car five or six times, and no muggle ever saw them. He swallowed and took another huge bite. Why couldn't we get through the barrier? Harry shrugged. We'll have to watch our step from now on though, he said. And took another huge bite. Why couldn't we get through the barrier? No, wait, we said that. Wish we could have gone up to the feast. She didn't want us showing off. One sedgely. Don doesn't want people to think it's clever arriving by a bewitched flying car. When they had eaten as many sandwiches as they could, the plate kept on filling itself. They rose and left the office, treating the familiar path to Gryffindor. Password, she said, as they approached. Ah, uh, said Harry. They didn't know what the New Year's password, not having met a Gryffindor prefect before, but help came almost immediately. They heard Where have you been? The most ridiculous room. Someone said you hadn't been expelled for crashing a flying car. Skip the lecture, said one impatiently, and tell us the new password. It's Wattlebird. But that's not the point. The words were cut. Short. However, as the however, as the portrait of the thingy was there, and there was a sudden storm of clapping. It looked as though the whole of Gryffindor House was still awake, packed into the circular room, common room, standing on the lopsided and squashy armchairs waiting for them to arrive. I've reached through 
the portrait how to pull Harry and Ron inside. Aunt reached, no, leaving Hermione to scramble in after them. Brilliant, Yod, rejoined him. In spite, what an entrance, a flying car right into the room penguin. People will be talking about that one for years. Good on you, said the fifth year. Harry had never spoken to someone fascinated. And on the as they he just won a mar marathon. Fred and George pushed their way to the front of the garden and said together, Why couldn't you have called us back, eh? One was scarlet in the face, grinning embarrassedly. Got to go upstairs. Bit tired, said the two of them. Night. Harry called back to Hermione, who's wearing a skull just like Harvey's. One guild guiltily at Harry. The dormitory door flew open and in came the other second year Gryffindor boys. Seamus Finnegan, Dean Thomas and Neville Longbottom. Unbelievable. Being Seamus. Cool, said Dean. Amazing. Neville also amazing. Harry couldn't help it. She grinned too. The end of chapter five. Thank you for 